Okay. The slide's supposed to speak for itself. No sound. All right. We thought we had this taken care of. I can sing. We may have to. <laughs> uh, let's see. I'm, I'm going to try this one more time. So much for practicing this before. <laughs> we have to dance too. <laughs> Isn't that always how technology works? We had this going. It was perfect. You yeah, did amazing. It sounded good. They told me it was on The singing is not going to be taken from our time. All right. <laughs> <laughs> taken from lunch. But I am available for weddings. <laughs> I mean, we love a Pacabella Cannon moment. That's yeah. what Let's try it, shall Let's try we? The, yeah, let's try the speakers. Mm. Oh, and I close the settings. It's unnerving to hear my voice. <laughs> Usually I'm the I'm the man behind the curtain. All right, let's try that. Play from the card slide. It's worth the wait. Forget that I signed. <laughs> you weren't here, it was okay. Thank you. 
the two events are quite different and yet related. The joy of Spain consists of two groups of participants. The first are the conspiratorial players, the musicians organized to surprise, while the second group of participants is the gathering audience, entertained by a group of supposedly accidental performers. The power of the January 6th gathering also had two groups of participants. The first are the conspiratorial players like the Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers, and perhaps the Trump campaign, while the second group of participants is the gathering audience staring by a group on stage and in the crowd among those around the ellipse. According to the House Select Committee investigating the January 6th insurrection at the Capitol, some of those in the second group became essential in providing the manpower needed to eminently reach the Capitol. A question looming in the background of the events of January 6th cases has been whether the violence at the Capitol was spontaneous or the result of sinister planning, whether spontaneous or the result of incitement or intentional provocation. There have been over 750 arrested nationwide for the assault on the U.S. Capitol on January 6, 2021. Some were charged with violent entry and disorderly conduct. Some charged with acts of physical violence on restricted grounds and civil disorder. Others charged for incitement have been contemplated while indictment has been handed down for a very different crime, that of seditious conspiracy. Now, incitement and seditious conspiracy can be seen as language crimes in which the criminal act is itself performed through language. Language crimes are about illegal speech acts. Crimes involve wrongful acts, and wrongful acts may be committed by the word. There are a host of these crimes, which include solicitation, perjury, threats, bribery, and conspiracy. Now, all language crimes concern themselves with an actor's intent, with some concerned with the intent of the actor themselves, the illocutionary force, and others concern themselves with the intent of the listener, of the hearer, referred to as perlocutionary effect. Now, they're classic examples of language and action. The words don't simply make assertions about a situation, but they create the situation. And conspiracies associated with agreement, agreement to commit a crime, and that agreement can be explicit or implied. Now, some jurisdictions actually require that there be some kind of follow-up of an overt act in furtherance of the conspiracy, while others don't have that requirement. Language crimes can be committed directly or indirectly. So you don't necessarily need the smoking gun that says, we agree, in order to have conspiracy. Um, linguistic cues can be taken by jury members um, in making their decisions. They can infer that that kind of agreement through the use of words like um, pronouns, like we. Seditious conspiracy uh, really ratchets up the criminality, the, the criminal culpability of conspiracy and suggests that um, the conduct in question goes beyond regular conspiracy um, and goes to the heart or strikes at the heart of American democracy and falls within the same conceptual category as some of the most 
serious political crimes. So within the same category as rebellion, insurrection, and treason. The seditious conspiracy charges are rarely brought, but we are currently witnessing the trial of Stuart Rhodes, the founder of the Oath Keepers, who stands trial on such a charge for what prosecutors say was not a suddenly ignited riot, but a coordinated plot to stop the transfer of presidential power. Seditious conspiracy is generally viewed as less as a less serious counterpart to treason. Case law suggests that key to proving such a case is unity of purpose, the intent to achieve a common goal. The pre-January 6th planning and the resultant flashlight mob becomes central to these charges. The word conspiracy is steeped in history and intrigue. I remember well, one can easily envision the whispering plotting well before March 15, 44 BC, when at a Senate meeting. It was just yesterday. Six, was it? Yes. Yeah. 60 conspirators surrounded Caesar, uncovering covering daggers from beneath their togas and stagging, stabbing him from all sides. This is my good part now. Uh, good luck. I'm According glad you got to this. the etymological dictionary, conspiracy is a plotting of evil, unlawful design, a combination of persons for an evil purpose. From the Anglo-French conspiracy, Old French conspira, conspiracy of plot. From the Latin, our Latin is not what it should be, Conspiratum, the nominative conspiro, agreement, union, unanimity, noun of action from past parsable stem of conspiracy to agree, unite, plot, literally to breathe together. I deserve some applause for that. <laughs> In U.S. law, Seditious conspiracy was codified into law after the Civil War to arrest Southerners who might keep fighting the U.S. government. In order to win a seditious conspiracy case, prosecutors have to prove that two or more people conspired to overthrow and put down or to destroy by force the U.S. government or bring war against it or that they plotted to use force to oppose the authority of the government or to block the execution of law. In this light, we are seeing a trial, are we seeing a trial as a, fair, as a flash mob or a conspiracy, or a flash mob as conspiracy? Now, according to the indictment, Rhodes began to plan the rebellion just two days after the 2020 election when he told Oath Keepers, members of the Oath Keepers, to reject Biden's victory at all costs. He said, we aren't getting through this without a civil war. He said in an encrypted signal ch chat over the following weeks, um, and in open letters and in private chats to use violence to stop Biden from assuming office. Um, and by the way, uh, driving in, I just heard that the use of civil war has spiked online 300 percent since um, some of the, the statements made by former President Trump in the last two days. Um, so this was the kind of language that was being used. In one instance, he said that if Biden were to assume the presidency, quote, we will have to do a bloody, massively bloody revolution against them. 
Now, on the basis of these statements and on other similar communication, Rhodes and 10 other defendants were charged under 18 U.S. Code 2384 with seditious conspiracy, among other crimes. Now, originally, uh, they were charged with conspiracy alone. And then as increasing evidence emerged, particularly of this kind of um, encrypted online chatter, uh, the crime was upped, ratcheted up, as I said before, to this criminal conspiracy with a superseding indictment. Now, while the flash mob is generally associated with the provocation of joyful interaction, um, can it not be used to provoke and organize insurrection, bodily harm, fear, threat, threat of death, conspiracy, persuasion, advocacy, incitement, and medium are inextricably intertwined. They're connected. The circumstances and the interpretation and the quest for truth provides us with the perception of reality of one reality and another. It is, we believe, the medium that's at the heart of the relationship between the message and the trusted source. Trust has become an increasingly um, studied phenomenon, and we could spend a great deal of time discussing that. But at this point in the time that we have remaining, we really want to focus on the nature of mediation and the mediated mob. Mobs haven't generally carried connotations of scheming or treachery. Political mobs in American history are not new. Yet, there's something new in contrasting this conspiracy and this mob, which brings the two together differently than mobs of old. That's a great phrase, the mobs of old. This, after all, was not a conspiracy which took shape in a movie-worthy, smoke-filled back room, nor was the resulting mob a chaotic band of uncoordinated fellow travelers swept up just for the moment. This was a conspiracy, a plan online, a heavily socially media-based conspiracy resulting in a mediated mob. One facet of the successful flash mob is the illusion of spontaneity. There is an element of surprise when a nearby unnoticed person suddenly joins the action. The participants of the flash mob are embedded in the crowd. There is a conspiratorial quality of the flash mob easily neglected in the produced experience of the impromptu spectacle. Trash mobs rely, or flash mobs, that's a great mistake, <laughs> rely on the overlapping of electronic con uh, connection and physical space. These spaces coexist and come together in the use of mobile media in public mass gatherings, such as the mob or flash mob, which stormed the US Capitol. Members of the Oath Keepers paramilitary group moving up the steps in the US Capitol used as encrypted messaging app to transmit, arrest this assembly. We have probable cause for acts of treason, election fraud, allegedly, that the Proud Boys use specific frequencies on Beifeng radios, Chinese-made devices that can be programmed for use on hundreds of frequencies. <clears throat> the use of Signal, an app for the end-to-end -end encrypting message, was strategically used. The plethora of social media posts reveal coordination and a feedback loop between participants, organizers, and even the sitting president. 
much social media facilitated plotting operated in closed, unmoderated groups with potential violence openly discussed. Now, significantly, the indictments made to date have not included the political leaders. And some of our examination has focused on um, a crime that has not resulted in any indictments yet, incitement. Incitement, another language crime, suggests that the legal system penalizes the utterance of words which relate to the commission of a crime. Now, both incitement and conspiracy are known as incohate crimes. Um, that means essentially that they're unfinished, incomplete. But the crime itself has been committed with the, um, the crime itself has been committed with the instigation, with the words that were uttered, regardless of any response. So it's really the um, attempt to arouse that's at the heart of the issue. In the United States, for words to be punished by the government, there must be implied provocation, the seeking of action, some deed that the government may prohibit. So the Speech Act, the words alone are not punishable but the words used to produce action can produce criminal liability. The seminal case on what has become the, um, the, what's known as the clear and present danger doctrine, which is at the heart of incitement law today, is Brandenburg versus Ohio. And this case dealt um, back in 1969 with uh, the leaders of a KKK group in Ohio um, advocating ultimately in, in the future, marching on, on Washington. Now this case actually refined a case that you all are, most of you are familiar with, and that's Schenck versus the United States. Schenck versus the United States is the case that deals with falsely shouting fire in a crowded theater. Okay, so this is the modification of that. And essentially, what Brandenburg does is it establishes a three-part test about when the government can punish, after the fact, subsequent punishment, protected communication. And essentially, what this test says is that the First Amendment is going to prohibit the government from regulating or punishing those words unless the speech is likely to incite lawless, imminent action. Therefore, incitement to imminent lawless action is considered unprotected from government regulation, unprotected by the First Amendment, allowing the government to punish. Now, this so-called Brandenburg test is also known as the um, imminent lawless action test. As I said, it's a three-part test, and it's really clear to understanding the probability by which words may actually incite and bring about unlawful action. The nature of the media of incitement is the key to understanding the events of January 6, 2021. The mob was not spontaneous. It wasn't a spontaneous event as so much discussion surrounded early in, um, in the reaction to January 6. But the mob was rather an amalgam of instigation and medium. The Brandenburg test and the issue of incitement itself can better be understood through the examination of the medium used to advocate as well as the media environment in general. The current media environment includes social media, access on demand, echo chambers, confirmation bias, political polarization, et cetera, and digitalization of the medium transforms the message. And it's, it takes one back to the relationship of language, messages, posts, texts, and the effect that it has when we considered the flash mob. The incitement embedded 
within the online announcements can easily be interpreted as a call to action, which may or may not be a call to imminent lawless action. If the mob on January 6th is considered a form of flash mob, given the degree of coordination online, the Brandenburg test could, do I sound like I'm making the indictment? Mm -hmm. Good, oh, since I got my lawyer hat on, okay. The Brandenburg test could be interpreted as imminent with the degree of predictability associated with the concomitant um, commitment of the organized groups communicating via social media. The language certainly directed a gathering at a concrete and predictable time and suggested mayhem. While not directly advocating violence, Trump did frame the moment as the last stand, needing to stop once and for all Congress from accepting the results of the election that afternoon, thereby shutting the door to more legal challenges. Finding implied provocation within the meaning of the clear and present danger doctrine is a reasonable conclusion. Now, we're reaching the conclusion before we incite you to riot. The we're standing between everyone in lunch, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> the made-for-television spectacle of January 6th, like the flash mob, represents not one isolated event but the culmination of mediated planning and provocation. The specific media environment is essential to establishing the element of excitement and seditious conspiracy. For instance, conspiracies are secretive, an agreement to commit an illegal act. The technologies of secrecy have grown exponentially. Each medium offers different degrees of increments of secrecy. The opportunity to communicate anonymously in closed, unmoderated online environments via encrypted channels are all components of the digital media landscape. When is the apparently spontaneous concealed plotting? When is it? How can law enforcement and laws adapt to a need to assume a hybrid reality lived at the intersection of electronics connection and physical space. To understand mobs and prove conspiracy requires acknowledgement of the inner workings of the technologies of secrecy. And finally, flash mobs are marked by an element of surprise, a mustering of people to briefly gather together in an unexpected way, and then disperse. And these events, at least in part, feel extemporaneous. Um, a key is the uh, that sense that there's something fleeting taking place in a public space. One aspect of a successful flash mob is that illusion of spontaneity. There's the element of surprise the unnoted, unnoticed person around you embedded in the crowd who suddenly joins the action. Some participants in the flash mob embedded in the crowd are particularly effective. And flash mobs rely, again, on that overlapping of the world of electronic connection and physical space. The interstice between the two is really key. These spaces coexist and come together in the use of mobile media, in public mass gatherings such as mobs and flash mobs. Those flash mobs that stormed the Capitol on January 6th. Now, while much attention, rightly so, has been paid to the very vivid, over violent crimes against people, against property, against the obstruction of governmental process of violence against police officers, we would argue that it's the significance of language crimes within the mediated context that should not be overlooked.